I'm really a morning person. You yeah, like I get up probably between five and five thirty every single day. Wow. Okay, I got you beat because I yeah. get up at three to go okay. for host morning edition. So. All oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. think of me okay. when you're up at that hour. Yeah. Will. yeah. I'm talking to women in power, and today we're at Dudley Cafe in Nubian Square to speak with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Well, first of all, Congresswoman, thank you so much for coming here to do this today. You kept rem remarking how good it was for you to be home. Tell me about that feeling. Well, you know. It's the greatest, I mean, outside of being um, the daughter of Martin and Sandy and uh, Conan's wife and uh, Cora's bonus mom, uh, serving in Congress is truly, you know, the greatest honor. Uh, I love it. And um, although I work in Washington, usually Monday through Friday. There's nothing like being home. I work in Washington, but I work for the people of the Massachusetts 7th. And so when I get to, to come home and just to be um, just in community, uh, to be in proximity, um, it's always very grounding. Mm -hmm. And you take so much from what you learn from the community to work, right? I mean, I know that cooperative governing is a really big deal for you. One instance that we already are seeing this unfold here at the Dudley Cafe yeah. is in the Ayana's Bowl, which is on the menu here. It's got which quinoa and tofu, spinach. Yes, yes, yes. Was, yes. That, a, was that a cooperative <laughs> governing moment? <laughs> so no, I wasn't. I wasn't enlisted in the in the development okay. of the bowl. Um, but I do have to say that I do love all those things. Yes. <laughs> um, but. Um, the cooperative uh, governing uh, that is manifest in the Dudley Cafe is that uh, starting back on my time on the Boston uh, City Council, you know, I, I've always uh, sought to, to lead in a way that is, um, you know, how I've campaigned has been disruptive and that it didn't follow conventional norms. And also how I've sought to um, effectuate change has also been different. So on the, on the Boston City Council, I created a, a new standing policy committee. Um, and it was the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities. And it was really defining health as the holistic health, the ecosystem of community, not just the delivery of health services. And so one of the things that I lifted up as critical to a healthy ecosystem and community um, are restaurants. You know, they're critical social, economic, cultural anchors. It's how we build community. It's how we create jobs. It's how we build wealth and um, uh, underserved uh, communities, uh, communities of color forever really did not have uh, equitable walkable amenities, um, which again are support the health of community and, and also it's public health, it's public safety, it's economic justice, it's racial justice. They create jobs for uh, people who experience barriers to employment. So uh, I'm just very passionate about uh, hosp the hospitality industry and restaurants. And so um, one of the, the, the legacy things that I'm proudest of in my time on the Boston City Council was working for four years with two mayors uh, to uh, usher in liquor license reform and with the state legislature, of course. It was a long uh, process. And um, ultimately, we were able to uh, create 75 new liquor licenses. And Dudley Cafe uh, was one of the establishments to benefit from that license. Uh, and so it's very full circle in that way. It's, it's really just seeing my values uh, in action and meeting people's dreams, aspirations, and um, their needs you know, seeing it all, all in one place. And this is one of the places that really has become, uh, I don't know, a center, you know, heartbeat to community. I love that people say, I'll, I'll meet you uh, at Dudley Cafe. And you can see there are people here just um, working in a corner alone or meeting up with people, so. And um, running into people like their own country. Yeah, that's, so, that's right, that's right. Well, So you talked about your mother, and I know that she was really adamant about grounding you in church when you were growing up. That's been the foundation for so much of the work that you've done. I, wanted, I want you to take me back to September 5th, 2018, right before, and we all saw the icon iconic video where you learn that you have won your election unseating incumbent con former Congressman Mike Capuano. I'm curious. Were you praying in those moments? And if so, what was your prayer? Well, I do make time every day. Uh, my husband and I are very intentional about carving out that space for 
reflection, prayer, meditation. Um, and so I, I, I pray often, uh, not just over my meals, um, in regular uh, communication uh, with God and, and really am uh, a person of faith. I grew up um, in a storefront church on the south side of Chicago where my grandfather was the pastor and uh, his influence in my life has really formidably shaped me in so many ways. Uh, in that moment, actually, I was still writing my speech and what I was doing was, um, you know, working um, uh, very closely with some members of my team who have been, been in my life for a long time, and I was trying to meet the moment, you know, preparing myself, not knowing which way it would go, so I had to write a speech that was going to work either for um, a victory or, or, a def or a defeat, if you will. And one of the things that I was thinking about was just I didn't want to go out there on that stage and look out into that crowd and see the light extinguished behind people's eyes. If, if we had not won in the conventional sense, if we had not achieved the outcome that we desired, I didn't want people to see that as a loss because um, I wanted us to stand in the fact that we had campaigned differently, that we had expanded the electorate, that people who had not previously felt hope or who had a deficit of trust about um, electoral politics and uh, and government that you know I saw their their minds changed I saw them realize um, the power of us and the power of movements and so really that's what I've been preparing myself for is how do I write a speech that um, you know if we are unsuccessful and all of the odds pointed you know to our being unsuccessful that this was a um, I knew it would be a lonely, uh, anticipated it being a lonely uh, journey, um, and I anticipated that uh, although I was running to win, that, that we might not. And so, yes, I was definitely praying, yeah. and in fact, what that video doesn't show is the first thing I did after I learned that news, I actually did drop to my knees, but that was not um, a part of, that wasn't a part of the video, but that was the first thing I did, just a, a prayer, you know. Um, yeah, to God, to my, to, to my mom, just a prayer of, of gratitude, and that I would just continue to be uh, a responsible steward mm -hmm. uh, in, every, in every single way. So, Ever yeah. since your campaign, you've continued to, to say that the people closest to pain need to be closest to the power. We're in a time where so many people are experiencing mm -hmm. so much pain. Are they, are they closer to the power than they were five years ago? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I love that we're in Roxbury because it also reminds me of my ceremonial swearing in uh, that I was very intentional about doing at Roxbury Community College where some 400 plus people came together and I had, had worked with community um, to develop a pledge that we would take together because I wanted to make it clear that yes, you're sending me to Washington, but I'm bringing you with me. And now that I've won, um, you can't step away. We have to do this work in symbiotic partnership. And so we've been very intentional in that way. So those 400 plus people uh, took that, that, that oath with me, made that commitment uh, to participate in cooperative governing uh, with me, uh, to be um, just as intentional uh, in the work of change um, as we would also be in informing our joy. Uh, and so I do believe that those closest to the pain um, are closest to the power. I do not cast a vote, uh, co-sponsor a bill, write a bill without doing it in close consultation and cooperation with those closest to an issue. And I have so many examples of that. In fact, uh, in the last five years, uh, one of the things that I'm proudest of is one of my bills being signed into law, the Post-Disaster Mental Health Act. And that was a, that was a bill uh, that was developed in, in close partnership with uh, marathon uh, bombing survivor Manya Chalinsky, who sent an email to our office and said, uh, I'm still uh, traumatized uh, from the day's events. Um, I did not sustain physical injuries, but my, my mental health was severely compromised. I'm very much experiencing um, PTSD and have been unable to access mental and behavioral health services. And so, um, you know, we figured that there were probably many more manias that were impacted in that way who were in need of psychological first aid and were unable to uh, access it. 
And so um, we worked together uh, over the course of two years, um, developed a bill. That bill uh, went through the process, was reported out of committee. It was a bipartisan bill. I think actually at the end of the day we had more Republican co-sponsors than Democratic co-sponsors. Um, and uh, that bill was signed into law by President Biden. And so now um, uh, with the marathon bombing what had happened is that it was characterized as an e emergency um, um, declaration but not a disaster and so for that reason so we just you know we uh, we were able to do a technical fix right and so now um, as you say there's so much more pain and a lot yes. of that pain has to do with things that used to be extreme anomalies happening with greater frequency whether you're talking about natural disasters or domestic terrorism and it's just so important that we make sure that people are able to access those mental and behavioral health services and I've and I've been following up because it's one thing for a law to get passed but you have to make sure that it's being implemented and so wherever there has been extreme uh, flooding um, or um, uh, a, a mass shooting or you know any sort of disruptive traumatic um, event I'm following up and asking have you been able to access uh, mental and behavioral health right. services and those are increasingly important because we're seeing increased mass shootings we're seeing homicides right we're seeing people dying by suicide. We have a mental health crisis on our hands. So I'm, I'm wondering about the person Can I say who so? is I just want to yeah, just build on that a little bit. Yeah, um, because that is, that is something that has been core to my work that began on the Boston City Council, these issues I was able to address in the micro, issues like trauma, um, that now I get to address on the macro level. And so I did recently introduce, reintroduce a resolution to federally establish a month for surviving family members of homicide victims. You know, just to make that point, that as we, um, while we continue to be confronted with the public health crisis uh, that is gun violence with an increase in suicide, uh, domestic violence, community-based violence, uh, mass shootings at schools, our faith houses, our, our, our public spaces, that we can't forget about those family members uh, that are left behind and, and also addressing their grief and, doing, and also doing the work of trying to get them closer to some version of justice. We'll, we'll never be able to really give them justice because justice would mean that their loved one would still be here. But um, we can get them on a pathway to healing and that also does support our broader goals of, of peace. And so you know, in any way that there is an ecosystem that is disrupted by um, a traumatic or devastating event, I just want to make sure that every type of survivor uh, is able to access those services. As we deal with all of these these really big issues, these really hard issues, right? You're, you're someone who people look to to be able to, to fix them, and, and fixes don't come easy, and you can't fix everything. And I know that you have said that you know you you can't you don't have the luxury of being weary of, of being tired in your fight. But what keeps you going on the days that you that you don't want to? That it's a little bit harder to get out of bed and go fight on the behalf of all of these people. Yeah, I mean, it's the people that I met this morning. It's the people that I meet every day uh, that I'm in, in community. It's this sense of um, deeper responsibility uh, that I feel. I don't have the luxury of being apathetic or, or cynical. People are depending on me to stand in the gap. People elected me to stand in the gap. And even the people who didn't vote for me, uh, I still represent them. I am their, their congresswoman. And so uh, the responsibility is incumbent upon me to uh, remain vigilant. And, and certainly given the current climate under which we've been governing, under a Republican majority in the House, which um, I think they, um, it has been chaotic. Um, uh, many of the policies that they've sought to advance are, are callous and cruel. And, uh, and because I love a good alliteration, uh, clueless. I mean, really just, it's been, uh, the 118th Congress has been in disarray and, and disconnected. Um, and so it is just so important that I remain um, vigilant. Now, what are some of the things that anchor me other than uh, community and, and the people that I have the honor of representing and serving? I love a good affirmation. I was sharing with you earlier, I read a lot of poetry. That is a, a constant in what I read. It's always been a balm for me. Um, I read a lot of Nikki Giovanni, uh, Maya Angelou, uh, Sonia Sanchez, Audre Lorde. Um, 
those are probably you know did I say Maya Angelou <laughs> those you did. okay so yes yeah, so yeah. those are those are a lot of my go tos um, and there is one poem um, that I, I recently had the opportunity to share at. Um, when I was eulogizing uh, someone uh, very influential in Massachusetts politics, John Walsh, and it's a poem by Marge Piercy called To Be of Use, and I think it just perfectly in, it encapsulates what it is to be a part of a movement and to move in common rhythm. And the last line of that poem is, the pitcher cries for water to carry and the person for work that is real. And, and really what is just, you know, appealing to summon in all of us that we are all meant to be of use. Each of us to sort of bring to bear our unique gift uh, to, to the work of um, change. So that guides me. And then there is an affirmation I say every day. Um, a dear uh, sister friend of mine named Brittany Packnett Cunningham uh, gifted it to me at the height of the pandemic and I've, I've carried it every day. And it's that um, I choose the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism. And I choose fortitude over fatalism. I choose the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism and fortitude over fatalism. It's sort of my own serenity prayer. And, and it has uh, it has kept me, it has anchored me. And obviously my family. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Who's it you call your husband? Is it Black Diamond? Is yes. That that oh right? my goodness. Now see, you, you, did, a, you, you, you did your research. <laughs> yeah. uh, I tried. <laughs> yes. And, and actually it's, it's so funny because, um, you know, other wives will tell me they heard me acknowledge my husband in that way from the stage or something. Yes. And then their husbands will say, you know, how come you don't have a name right. for me? You know, <laughs> so, so I'm creating, I'm creating problems, you know. Yeah. So, but, um, but yes, my husband Conan and, and my bonus daughter, uh, Cora, um, and our cat Sojo. Oh. <laughs> Her name is Sojourner Truth Presley Harris. Oh, um, because, wow. yes, because everyone in our household yes. must do the work of abolition yes. and freedom, okay? <laughs> Um, yeah. And my husband said, you know, she has white paws. Can we, we rescued her? And he said, can we just call her Socks? I'm like, no. He no, said, she said, have a yeah, name with some, yeah, some historical said, yeah, See, everyone has to be abused. <laughs> so, yeah, including yes, the cat. Well, yes, they, they have nine yeah. lives, so I'm that's sure right, she was fighting. That's right, that's right, yeah. So, 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 we, so we call her Sojo. Also, um, you know, um, uh, so affirmations, reading poetry, uh, the love and support of my family, um, uh, the embrace of community, and uh, I'm a big tea enthusiast. Oh, you uh, are. Yes, I'm a yeah. big. Well, you're I, having matcha yes, now. Yes, I'm having matcha, but I I, I gave up coffee uh, probably about four years ago, and um, you know since then I've been really just researching uh, the medicinal uh, benefits of many different teas. So I, I love tea, and that's something that I do, um, and I like routine. I'm very regimented in that way. And, I and, I, it's really and I'm really a morning person. You yes. know, like I get up probably between 5 and 5.30 every single day. Wow. Okay, I got you beat because I yeah. get up at 3 to go okay. to host morning edition. So. All right, yeah. So yeah. think of me. Okay, you're I, will. I will. I will. I will, yeah. So yeah, 5 to 5.30 and I always, you know, start after I hydrate, you know, yes. with some tea. Beautiful. And that's how I close out the night as well. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I imagine, I mean, those those practices are so important because as you alluded to, the time that you are governing in is tumultuous in many, many ways. We're headed into a big election year. Mm. Obviously, there's a presidential election, but there are all these congressional elections, too, that are going to be very consequential for, for where we go from here. Are, are you excited about a Biden-Harris ticket in 2024? Yeah. You know, as you said, our challenges have never been greater, and, um, and every day it's very clear How should I say this? I think a lot about January 6th and just how close we came uh, to losing it all, right? And what we have seen is this emboldened, coordinated, unrelenting assault on our democracy, um, rollbacks and the undermining of gains that have been made uh, in civil rights. And under this Republican uh, majority, in the House every day just seeking to exact harm. Uh, they are anti, they are undemocratic, you know, uh, anti-democracy. They are anti-woman, uh, anti-immigrant, uh, anti-worker. Uh, they traffic hate. 
Um, they want to deny us access to our ballots, autonomy over our bodies, and they want to ban our books. Uh, and so we have to do everything possible uh, to defeat them so that we can right the wrongs and uh, undo the harm that they have caused. So it sounds like that the best possible option to do that right now is who we have in the White House. Oh, absolutely. And, and moreover, um, I think that Democrats win. Well, not I think, I know. We win when we deliver. I don't want people to know what Democrats have done based on a press release. I want them to know based on the, the, what they feel in their life tangibly. When we had that child tax credit, people felt the impact of that. This is why I continue to fight for really transformative policies like student debt cancellation. That's a $2 trillion uh, crisis affecting people from every walk of life. I have senior citizens uh, who fear that they will die still paying on this debt. At this time, they owe more than they, than they took out. Senior citizens who have had their benefits garnished because they've defaulted on loans. A whole generation that can't uh, purchase homes, start a business, grow a family. There's a disparate burden of this $2 trillion crisis on women. Uh, Two-thirds of it is on the shoulders of women. And of course, it's a racial justice issue because black and brown students borrow and default at higher rates. And we worked so hard uh, with the White House to get that executive action by President Biden only for it to be obstructed by this far-right, extreme, imbalanced uh, Supreme Court, which have been enlisted as co-conspirators in that agenda that I spoke of earlier that is anti-woman, democratic, immigrant, and worker. So it is really key. Um, it, it is really key that Democrats get that gavel back, and I'm going to do everything in my power to ensure that that does happen. Um, while continuing to push for, you know, I think there's a, a tendency sometimes to try to fringe or marginalize the issues that progressives champion. But the fact of the matter is that the, the American people want us to advance policies that go as far and as deep as they're heard. They're calling on us. Uh, to be bold, to be transformative, to go deep. And there are so many things during the pandemic that we started that we've been saying for years we could not do. And so now I, I continue to fight for uh, us to continue to do those things. Um, you know, whether it's making sure that uh, we don't uh, let up in the fight for uh, universal child care, for paid leave, you know, all of these, uh, you know, for federal investment in housing. Um, all of those things that are essential because during the pandemic everyone said every inequity and disparity and racial injustice was laid bare and it was worsened but it's like okay so now what are you going to do about it we're just going to default to an unjust status quo so we have to get that gavel back in the house democrats have to win so we can continue to um, and, I, and i think we're making the affirmative case and i think that from a policy agenda the biden harris administration and that we have been able to uh, advance um, the Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS legislation, uh, uh, infrastructure, um, reduce the cost of prescription drugs, insulin, you know, specifically. Yeah. So. Well, moreover, it sounds like it's not so much about excitement, right, as it is about necessity. Because even the president himself has said if former President Trump wasn't running, he said this while on a fundraising visit in Boston, that if the former president wasn't running, or at least that was a, a really big part of why he was running for re-election. So is it, is it, you know, in so many ways, we, we were here in 2020 where people were voting out of necessity. And so how do people, how do you rally people to get excited about that again? Again, by making the affirmative case for Democrats. Um, and I think we're making that case every day. I mean, the fact that um, it, it was under a Democratic majority in, in the House that uh, community project funding was brought back, that those were previously referred to as earmarks. And I've been able to deliver some $26 million in community project funding um, that supports everything from trauma-informed health care to workforce development uh, to climate resilience to transportation justice to education equity. You know, so again, and it's those sort of, um, I think, community project funding is a great example of the symbiotic partnership I choose to be in, which is one where the solutions are community driven and government endorsed, you know, not the other way around. Um, and these broader fights that we have to keep up that are so uh, essential to 
um, people not just surviving, but truly thriving. Policy is my love language. And, and that is because every harm is one that was codified in a budget or in a law. And so if we want to undo centuries of harm, if we want to change the legacy of the Massachusetts 7th, improve those outcomes, this is the most unequal district in our Massachusetts delegation. We're in a three mile radius from Cambridge to Roxbury in that number one bus ride. The life expectancy drops by 30 years and median household income by $50,000. That is as the result of decades of um, divestment, uh, under-resourcing and policy violence. So I think it's possible to legislate equity, to legislate healing, and to legislate justice, and that will certainly be much easier uh, under uh, a Democratic administration and with the Democrats having the gavel back in the House and Hakeem Jeffries well, I wanna, being our speaker. Yes, and I want to talk about that because I know that so many of you rallied behind Congressman Jeffries uh, to, to become the Speaker of the House. Obviously, it, as things shook out, it became Mike Johnson. But right now, there's a lot of pressure because of the split that's in the Democratic Party over the conflict in Gaza and the war between Israel and Hamas. And people are looking towards Congressman Jeffries to, to support those who have come out against, very firmly, against what Israel has been doing in Gaza. I know that you've called for a ceasefire. Several of your, your colleagues of the squad have done the same. But also, they've, you know, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib of Michigan has been censured for, for comments and rhetoric that she has, has said about the war. She is Palestinian of herself, we should note. So what, what, how did the Democrats, what, what, how would they be defined by this moment on this particular issue? Because it has the potential to split the party. It already is. Mm. Well, you know, uh, we're a big tent party and we're a big tent caucus. And, um, you know, even though we may, off, we, may, we may at times see a different path to achieve an end, I think it's fair to say we all want the same end, which is uh, peace, you know, lasting peace. And, and, and I also think it's important to note that uh, I'm certainly not, you know, standing alone or even in a, in a very, very small minority when it comes to uh, calling for a, a ceasefire. Um, this is uh, something that uh, well over 40 members of Congress have called for, um, that the UN has called for, the President of France, the, the Pope, um, and certainly the millions that have uh, mobilized uh, in our streets um, in advocating for, for peace. I support a ceasefire because I want to save lives, all lives. And very often in government, these unjust binary choices are foisted onto us. And I reject that on every issue, not just when it comes to Israel and Gaza, in the same way that, yes, I'm going to fight for universal child care, that it be accessible, quality, and affordable, and I want to make sure that we take care of the workforce. And, and very often, we're, you know, the, we're, these binary choices are foisted onto us. Um, I want to center the humanity and the dignity of everyone and fight to save everyone's lives. And history has taught us that we cannot bomb our way to peace. Um, the path to peace is one of diplomacy. And, um, you know, it, it, it breaks my heart that this humanitarian uh, pause has been stopped. It was an encouraging sign in the right direction. We were able to see hostages is freed and returned to their families. Um, but again, let me just make this unequivocally clear. I condemn the horrific, heinous acts of October 7th, which robbed us of 1,200 uh, Israeli lives. And uh, I am devastated by the 17,000 Palestinian lives that we have lost, uh, over every single one, but uh, overwhelmingly women and children. You know, this has uh, been a conflict for 75 uh, plus years. Um, and uh, I believe, like Dr. King believed, that the three evils of our poverty, racism, and militarism and so I'm always going to make an appeal for organize, mobilize, and legislate for peace and diplomacy. Now that and in this instance, a ceasefire to save lives, to that, save that, Israelis, to save Palestinians, to save uh, American hostages. The path to peace 
is diplomacy. Now that differs from, say, two of your Massachusetts congressional colleagues, Jake, Congressman Jake Auchincloss and Congressman Seth Moulton, who have been pretty firm about supporting Israel and doing what they need to do to find justice for what happened on Well, it's a big delegation. Right. I mean, like I said, first of all, we, we have an incredible delegation. I'm so honored to be a part of it. I have tremendous respect for all of my colleagues and how they arrive at their decisions that are directly shaped and informed by their own lived experiences. And I'm not alone in our Massachusetts delegation. Jim McGovern is also called uh, for a ceasefire. So when you have a Democratic Party and a Democratic House caucus that is Big Ten, you're going to have people to speak to every uh, every every faction, if you will, and the people they of, represent of, are of our party, are all different and diverse. A the absolutely, state. you know. But I I am not about. Uh, I reject unjust binary choices, and I'm not about uh, creating any sort of hierarchy of hurt. I'm about equitable outrage, equitable compassion and then doing the work in pursuit of our shared humanity and our collective freedoms. And that is a through line for me uh, from my time on the council and, and all the way uh, to my time in Congress. You are a style icon in many ways, not just um, <laughs> from your appearance, but from how you legislate. And okay, I, and okay. I, I want to walk through this with okay. you because I was going to say, who said that? <laughs> okay. I knew you, well, the New York Times did name you one of their 93 people here in 2022. Girl, I literally just wear black every day, so I don't know. But, 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 it's, I'll but take it's, a, it. it's, it's complimentary, the yeah. two, right? Because you mentioned compassion in your legislating, and you do things like, like really push legislating joy, which you did through our. our attempting to do through the Crown Act, uh, which bans ha racialized hair discrimination, and obviously that's that's a core to you because of your own journey. With yes, your by the way, shout diagnosis. out to your braider. Okay. <laughs> she, she was my roommate. Braider. She does have a because, business. I'll tag her. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, Thank you it's very such much. An you have relation, a relationship. 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 Yes, it you is. Know. It really I, is. I embrace my, my alopecia crown, um, but I, I loved having braids, and, and I love... And I love that relationship with, with my braider. But, but yes, you know, I do seek to legislate uh, equity, um, to legislate healing, to legislate justice, to legislate, uh, you know, joy. And there is a, a, an incredible joy when you can show up in the world fully, authentically, and unapologetically as yourself. And, you know, even before uh, my, um, before I was personally impacted by the autoimmune disease that is alopecia totalis, um, that, that is, you know, taken away my uh, my hair crown there. Yeah. Um, I did already, you know, was already developing a bit of a legislative portfolio on what I would call hair politics and policy. Um, because of that federal legislation for the Crown Act uh, to ban race-based hair discrimination. Um, but that has continued. I've introduced with Jim McGovern a legislation for medically durable wigs to be covered by insurance because they're often very cost prohibitive. Um, I've also been able to advance money uh, for research through the National Institutes of Health to better understand the impacts of um, the disparate impact of autoimmune diseases like alopecia and lupus on, on women of color. And of course, not going to go on. Legislation uh, around traction alopecia in the, in the, in the, in the military. Yes. Um, and then uh, more recently, because I want to just, let me just say this. You said, how do we keep people um, engaged and mobilized? So one is that they have to feel the impact of what we're doing. They, they don't just learn about it because they, they saw it on uh, a social media feed or read it in the newspaper, but because they can feel the impact. The second is that our government has to be responsive to the needs of people. So that's why I seek to, to govern in a way that is intentional and cooperative. And, and that does mean that things take longer, right? Because it, you're going to do five more meetings, two more phone calls, you know, but I'm, I'm willing to inconvenience myself um, for my family, my human family, to ensure that I'm advancing legislation that is responsive to their needs and that they feel, um, that they feel seen. Um, and then the other is reminding people all the power we still have available to us. We may be governing under a Republican majority, however, we still have available to us the power of the pen as legislators, the power of letterhead, the power of platform, uh, the power of convening, the power of the movement. And just to round out that discussion on hair politics and policy more recently, I did use the power of uh, my letterhead in asking the, the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, to follow up on these reports drawing a link between formaldehyde and chemical hair relaxers and um, 
uterine cancer. And, and in fact, they, they did uh, follow up uh, on that, and now the FDA uh, seeks to ban the use of formaldehyde in those chemical hair relaxers. And that's a public health issue. You know, so even if you say, well, I'm not a, a black woman or I don't use hair relaxers, this is a matter of the, this is a matter of the public health. And, and when you think about the fact that the reason we had to, and shout out to the Massachusetts legislature for passing the Crown Act here, I think it was the, the 28th uh, state um, uh, to, to pass it, but um, in the state level, but what we seek to, to do that federally is if you're experiencing discrimination in the workplace, maybe you don't get an interview, maybe you're not uh, promoted, maybe you don't get a raise, because if you do a Google search right now of unprofessional hairstyles, you will be besieged by images of black women usually wearing their hair in an ethnocentric, protective hairstyle, you know, or wearing uh, an afro um, or, um, or locks, right? And so if you feel that social pressure, then you will um, maybe feel like your only choice is to have your hair chemically straightened and you deserve to show up in the world however you want, whether with your hair relaxed um, or in, in its natural uh, curly state. But regardless, you should not experience discrimination and your public health certainly should not be at risk. And that's just one example. I mean, I just, that, that brought about a change just by myself and inviting my sister colleague, uh, Chantel Brown from Ohio to join me. We were able to shine a light on that issue and then to get uh, the government to respond. Or on, well, I first want to ask where you are, because I know that your alopecia journey has been a journey. Where, yeah. where are you in the journey now? Um, and so, he was the one who said you can still wear a crown. Yeah, you, you don't, don't need hair to hair, rock right? a crown. You know, so so I'm in a good place. This is I take. Speaking of the power of the platform, now you know I steward the power of my platform as an alopecia ambassador uh, to bring to bring awareness uh, to the millions of people that are living with this autoimmune disease. So so I feel yeah. good. This is I'm my glad crown. To hear it. You know, I'm rocking it, and um, you know. I do want to pick up since we're talking about hair because I remember a tweet from a few a couple years ago where um, your your bon your daughter Cora yeah. wanted to dye her oh hair gosh. blue. <laughs> okay. And she made a PowerPoint presentation yes. and a all this stuff. A six-page slide. Yes. Deck. And she was young. She was relatively yes, young and yes. you all said no. But has she been able to dye oh her hair gosh. since? Can I tell you <laughs> the backlash I got <laughs> yeah, on that. They came for me. <laughs> Uh, well, you, I will, I'm happy to report um, that actually, you know, we, we have supported her in her personal and self-expression, and, um, you know, she has dyed her hair. <laughs> um, she's 15 now. You know, we're, we're very proud of her, and, um, you know, I think about her a lot. I think about her a lot. Um, you know, at her eighth grade graduation, was the day that the Dobbs decision came out and Roe was overturned. And I, you know, remember just starting the day out feeling so hopeful and optimistic about her future. And, and of course I still am. But in real time, when that decision came out, um, I felt so heavy, I felt dread, because I felt that it was precedent. I didn't know what else might be coming that would mean that my daughter could grow up in a world where she had fewer rights uh, than I grew up with. Um, and uh, I do uh, have uh, the honor, having been uh, appointed, if you will, by my peers, of chairing the Abortion Rights and Access Task Force uh, under the Pro-Choice Caucus, and um, you know have certainly used the power of the pen uh, as a legislator uh, to ensure uh, health care access, and uh, abortion is health care. Um, and so uh, that work of reproductive rights, of maternal justice, I've also used the, the, the power of, of the pen as, as a lawmaker um, around uh, the maternal morbidity crisis and its disparate impact on, on black women, which is very linked to this march by Republicans towards really a nationwide ban uh, on abortion. So what is that? It's forced birth. And when you consider the fact that black women are are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth or post-birth in complications. This is a matter of life and death. And my own uh, paternal grandmother, Grandma Carrie, who I have a picture of uh, in, our, in our home, I have a shelf that I call our, 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 our wall, it's like our ancestor wall. And I, I never got to know her because she died in the 1950s giving birth to my father's youngest brother. And so the fact that uh, 
uh, my paternal grandmother, Grandma Carrie, uh, died in the 1950s in childbirth, and that in 2023, that black women would still be three to four times more likely to die in childbirth or post-birthing complications is unacceptable. And so this is why I don't, you know, I don't, I don't mind taking hard votes. I, I don't. Uh, I'm okay if everyone doesn't like me. Uh, I'm in this to do the work of changing and saving lives. And I'm gonna organize, mobilize, legislate like lives depend on it, because they do. So you're talking about, you know, not only with the women you're legislating for, with your daughter's generation, but when you look back on the Boston City Council and how mm. it changed after you became the first black woman on the council and see all the women of color who came after you, one of them who's now our mayor, when you look at your impact in Congress and how you've really been a leader for the squad, first of all, like, you did that, <laughs> you know, and I think, I think everybody, it was a collective effort, but so much of, of your existence has been emblematic. What do you want the little girls who are looking at you now to take away from your leadership? You belong. You belong. Um, you know, I first I have to say it's a testament to the electorate um, that I became the first woman of color, first black woman to serve on that body in its 100 year history. Uh, serving alongside uh, some incredible public servants uh, and and now uh, those are you know presidents of important nonprofits um, our attorney general our mayor a state senator so it's it was an incredible uh, cohort in class of, of exemplary public servants to serve alongside and, um, and now to see uh, really a, a sea change in the face of Massachusetts politics. And, and, and moreover, that people now, I think, have a greater appreciation for um, just how we have a very deep bench. Uh, we have the most representative government at, at every level uh, that we've ever had, including uh, with our, uh, our, our power duo uh, at the State House uh, and our governor and our, and our lieutenant governor. Um, there's been a complete uh, sea change in the landscape in the face of, of Boston politics, of Massachusetts politics, and it's be, been very humbling to be a part of that being ushered in. But again, it is a testament to, uh, to the electorate. Uh, and so I think what they continue to affirm is the power of having a government um, that is, is representative of the people. And you need that because when you have people that are bringing a diversity of lived experience or perspective, opinion, and thought, they call different questions. If, if, if everyone around policy decision-making tables and in the corridors of power has the same lived experience, the issues that are raised are monolithic and homogenized, and the solutions are not as innovative. I mean, this is why I say the people closest to the pain, closest to the power, driving and informing the policymaking are, you know, I think about someone like uh, Councilor uh, Mejia, a single mom, you know, raising a daughter just like me and my mom, and the difference it would have made to have people in positions, legislative uh, positions, who had our lived experience and how that would have shaped the policies. You know, it, it just, um, and, and everyone brings their own unique lived experience. It's just that we have not always had those rooms, those spaces, those tables representative of every walk of life of every lived experience. I remember when I was first elected, people would say, who suffered before you were elected? Was it, was it black folks or women? And I said, you know, everyone was at a disservice because government is always stronger and more effective when it's representative of the people that it serves. And so um, to be here today as the first person of color, first black woman to represent the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the House of Representatives, 230 year history, uh, it is, a great honor and it is a tremendous responsibility and um, you know people will sometimes remark now people who really know me will tell you that I'm funny I have a good sense of humor but for, for people who don't like know know me they'll probably say she seems very you know serious uh, and I am you know I'm serious about this work um, and in having grown up in electoral politics, in movement building, in legislative spaces. I mean, I think sort of, for, you know, there's this narrative like I just sort of 
fell out of the sky and was in Congress. I worked on my first campaign at the age of 10 years old. Uh, four years for a member of, of Congress, 11 with the United States Senator, eight years on the council, um, and now five in, in Congress. And, um, you know, this is, uh, I don't know anything else. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I don't want to. I believe in the power of us. I believe in the power of movements. Um, and I believe in, in, in the transformative power and impact of good government and responsive lawmaking when it's done in partnership with the people. When you're proximate to the people, you better understand the complexities, the nuance, the intersectionality. I don't silo people. It's all connected because that's how people actually live. So when you are intentional about being proximate, when you're willing to do 10 more calls, five more meetings, just to engage those people closest to the pain, not only do you better understand the problem, but that is how you cultivate and harness the best solutions. So any success that I have, legislatively or electorally, it's shared. Because I believe power is something that is meant to be shared. So. You have a birthday coming up. You're the big 5-0, oh, in fact, in oh, February. Okay. How are you feeling and how do you plan uh, to celebrate? Well, I mean, I've been told 50 is the new 30. I, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, you wear, <laughs> you wear well. Hope that's true. I hope that's true. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing my best. Um, but that is hard to believe. You know, I remember um, when I was in elementary school uh, being given the assignment to write an essay about um, what will you accomplish by the age of 25? And I, I think I said I would have three degrees and two children. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how old you are, but 25 is still very young. I'm a little bit older than that. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, still very young. That's so, encouraging. And so, right, but it just shows how, you know, you just really don't have any concept of time. So when I was, you know, 10 years old, I thought of 50 as very old. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, I think uh, I still have a lot of, a lot of uh, living to do, a lot of work to do, a lot of change to make, and I'm just centering gratitude in all ways, and, and I'm looking forward to celebrate, but I'm gonna put folks on notice. I'm not celebrating for one day. <laughs> I'm not celebrating for one week. I'm not even doing one month. Okay. You, I, so just be prepared. You're gonna be very annoyed by the hashtags. Just, you know, I love it. all year, it's gonna be, this is 50. Okay. All year, this is 50. It's so like we already did 50 so years of hip hop, yeah, now yeah, it's like 50 well, years exactly. of Congresswoman Diana Presley. So you get the vibe, okay. Yeah. But I mean, but it's it, but it's it's a big year in many ways. It's a five my five year anniversary in Congress, uh, turning fifty years old. My ten year wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations! So, yeah, so this is this, it's a season of milestones. Yeah. 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 Well, twenty twenty four should should be monumentous in many ways. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Congresswoman, thank you. It has been an absolute absolute pleasure and an honor. And oh, thank, thank you for you, making so many Paris. people like me feel seen. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Likewise.